Welcome back to week seven of the 2024 Pantry Challenge, which will actually be the last week for us. This week delivered on some really simple meals that were among our best of the entire challenge. So if you're looking for some easy meals that everyone is sure to love, plus the juicy details on where we're headed next, make sure to stay right here because we're about to get into it. We are kicking off this last week at our house with our Super Bowl Sunday cupcake. And I have to say, I think maybe this was the secret to get the Chiefs the win, if you ask my kids. But in all reality, this was something that the kids really wanted to do. So we went ahead and made a sourdough vanilla cupcake to go along with our party festivities. Traditionally, we're not a huge sweet family, but when there are special occasions like birthdays or parties of some sort, I like to make sure that I have one of the healthiest options that I can on hand, and any kind of sourdough that has some time to ferment is going to be a little bit healthier than a traditional recipe. So the recipe that I'm using here is the uh, vanilla sourdough cupcake recipe off the Farmhouse on Boone blog, and I will make sure to link all of the recipes that I'm using throughout this entire cook um, down below. So if you see anything during this process that you want to try to get your hands on, make sure to check out the description. I'll also put links to anything uh, that you might see me using in the kitchen if you decide to shop my kitchen. That link will be below as well. But back to the cupcake here. I'm just finishing up the mix. I love to get it blended up really on high speed before heading into the other room where we're going to put together our cupcake tray. Now, once it's time to do a project like this, I have more than just one helper eager to join the party. So the girls just love putting out the cupcake wrappers and they also love filling up all of the dough. Now, of course, that gets a little bit tricky because when you're using the papers like these, it's great to make sure that you're keeping as much off of the actual parchment paper cups as possible just in order to keep it clean. So along with my help, we tried our best to get that done. And of course, every single one of the girls wanted to get involved. So it turned into quite the little project before we got it done. For the icing, we decided to go with a butter and cream cheese frosting that we blended up in high speed in our mixer as well, and we did make sure to add a little vanilla. Now, vanilla is something we ran out of during this cupcake process, and part of why we're ending our, our, our pantry challenge a little early, so stay tuned for more details on that. Now, for our first real meal of the week, I wanted to try something new with a pork loin roast that I usually just roast off in the oven. So I started this out the same way. I go ahead and make sure to get the thing super dry because I feel like that gives me the best sear in the pan. So after I'm getting it dried up here, I'm gonna go ahead and salt and pepper the top of the roast. Now I only do the top because I want the seasoning that I'm putting on there to stay on and I don't wanna have to flip it back and forth on the cutting board itself. But in order to do this and to get both sides accomplished before the end, I'm gonna make sure to do that once I have the side that you're seeing now face down in the cast iron. So before I brought this over, you can see that I had the pan really, really hot. And that is the key to making sure that you get a nice sear on all sides. So with this, the side that we seasoned face down, I'm gonna go ahead and add salt and pepper to the top and then let this set until I get a nice crispy brown on the bottom. And then I will continue to flip this around in the pan until I get all sides done. 
One thing that is really easy to forget is that when you're working with a piece of meat this thick, it's not as simple as top and bottom. You have to make sure to get the long sides as well as the ends before you finish up the process because that searing is what helps to keep all of the juices inside the meat itself. Once I had that finished, I went ahead and put it into my Instapot with the rack, so lifted up on the trivet, and I added some broth to the bottom. If you have pork broth, of course, go ahead and use it, but if you don't, a beef broth would be fine, or if you're not gonna use the juices from it for a gravy or something else of the sort at a later point, you can just add water. You're really just looking for some liquid to make sure that it stays moist inside the pot while it's cooking. Now, once you get this placed inside the Instapot, you wanna try to calculate around 20 minutes per pound. This one was a little over three pounds and I did it for an hour. I will say in the future, I think I'll go a little bit shy on that uh, because it, while it was still delicious and moist, we like it a little less done uh, than what it came out and it was well above the safe temperature reading. So, my plan for the future when I try this again is to shoot for around 17 minutes per pound and see if that brings it back a little bit more into our personal desired doneness. Uh, if you do like your pork well done, then this 20 minutes per pound would be great for you. I'm not sure if you noticed or not, but I had a little helper join me during that process and she is all too eager to make sure she is the one to push the button. So she's the one who sealed the deal and got this going for us while we moved on to our side dish. To go along with it, I'm grating some Parmesan cheese here. And as you are about to see, I'm also gonna grate my knuckle in with it. Ugh, and I can tell you even days later, I am still recovering from that little slip on the grater. I, I truly hate box graters and I try my best to not use them or B, definitely to make sure that my kids are being super safe, but I was just distracted and dealing with a super hard cheese and there you go, just days later, still babying that knuckle. Uh, but onto the real meal that doesn't include my finger, um, I'm putting in some frozen broccoli. Now, our family has a big stock of frozen vegetables, which has been great to go through during this pantry challenge. One of the real huge reasons that that's important to me is that we have ordered half beef from my brother who owns a huge processing plant. It's gonna be half Wagyu, which I'm super excited about. But anyway, I have to go pick it up at the end of this week. So if you're curious about what cuts I have to have with a big family to make it easier for me to make sure that I can feed them, uh, or what I've just found that works super well for us, let me know down below and I'll try to get some content out on that for you if you're interested in freezer beef and how we put it together. But back to the broccoli, this one turned out super good. Um, what you saw here was just the frozen broccoli in the pan and to that I'm adding some garlic powder, uh, some salt, some lemon pepper, and some basil. And after that cooks down, I'm letting it cook until all of the water from the ice that was on the broccoli cooks completely out of it. And once it does, then I'm gonna go ahead and finish it with the Parmesan that you saw earlier, in addition to some lemon juice. Now this recipe came together in maybe 10 minutes total and was really, really good. Everybody was super happy with it. So if you're looking for a quick and easy recipe to throw together for a side dish, Definitely make sure to drop down and find the link to this in the comments because it was really like the kids were super happy with it. So it's definitely one that we'll pull out again.
When the timer was up on the roast, I let it stay in the Instapot for about another 10 minutes to let the steam start to come out naturally. I've done some reading that that helps with the tenderness of the final product, so I wanted to make sure I gave it that rest time. Once I pulled it out, I set it on my cutting board and gave it another 10 minutes. And as you can see here, it is still plenty hot. Now before I start plating it up, I like to make sure, especially when dealing with a bunch of little kiddo plates, that I have enough pre-chopped that I can go ahead and fill their plates plus have a second round ready to go so I don't have to spend my meal time over at the cutting board chopping up some extra meat or have my husband get up and do the same. We have found over the years that as we've added more kids, doing little things like this during the mealtime prep process really helps us to have a smoother time while we're all actually seated at the dinner table. So if you are starting to grow a larger family, I definitely recommend just taking the extra minute or two before you call them in to go ahead and pre-prep some stuff like this just to save yourself a little bit of extra time. During the time that the broccoli was actually cooking off is when I chopped up that meat. So here I am finishing off the broccoli with the lemon juice as well as the Parmesan. And once those two got in there, all you have to do is a quick toss before it's ready to be plated. So again, super simple and full of flavor. Definitely do recommend this one. To go along with this meal, I decided to cook up a couple cups of rice. I usually add some sort of broth for the liquid just to make sure I'm adding some extra nutrients to it, but that's a total option. Just whatever works best for your family there. Um, I was trying to fi finish up a five gallon bucket of rice that we've been working through as well during this pantry challenge, so it really helped me to be able to get that done. The next evening, my goal was enchiladas, but during the day, my husband came up with a special plan for my youngest son's final basketball practice of the season. So he arranged for all of the team moms to come and play without our boys knowing for their final practice of the year. We did a little scrimmage for the last 15 minutes of their practice, and it was so funny. My girls were so confused. They had no idea what was going on. Like, mom, how are you going to do this? You don't even know how to play basketball. So it was great to be able to surprise them. And I'll see if I can put some footage in here. Uh, if I can grab that off my husband's camera. I was obviously busy at the time. So instead of the enchiladas that we had planned, I had to shorten this up for a little bit easier of a meal. Now, one of my goals for this pantry challenge was to make sure that I perfected a homemade tortilla. Now, that is what you're seeing me do here. We turned enchilada night into taco night, and I went ahead and made these with freshly milled wheat, and I also used lard. Now, I know there are many different ways that you can put a tortilla together, but after watching a few different people make them on YouTube and seeing that, tra that the traditional way was to use lard, I thought we'd give it a go. So here I am adding the water to my flour and lard mixture and just going ahead and putting together that dough. And, and it actually came together a little easier than I thought. Once in a while, February gives us a gift, and this was one of those absolutely beautiful weather days. So my whole crew, along with my nephew, were over at the house playing right outside the kitchen window, and I just really love when they can get out and get some fresh air while I can be accomplishing tasks inside. Now, my big ones are so great with little sister. She was actually out there with them, so that's why you don't see her up helping me knead this dough but it came together rather fast and it was actually rather peaceful inside, which is something I don't normally say. I probably actually could have had the audio on at this point, uh, but I like to keep it consistent and you never know what's gonna happen or who's gonna come running in the door. So we're sticking with the voiceover and pulling off all the audio because it is bound to happen and it absolutely does here shortly. 
So at this point, I had the dough completely kneaded. I took a little bit extra of the lard and just put it on the outside of that dough to make sure that it stayed really moist before I went ahead and cut this up. I portioned this out into 10 tortilla shells and tried to keep them pretty even. I did not weigh these. Of course, that would be an extra step if you wanted to, but I went ahead and got them balled up and set them on my platter so they could rest covered for at least 30 minutes so the gluten could develop in order for us to be able to stretch them out to the appropriate size and to make sure they got paper thin. In the past, this is where I went wrong with my, my tortilla process. I usually had tried to just use my tortilla press and didn't give that wait time and the press itself just does not get the shells thin enough to where they come out like a tortilla. They were coming out more of a flatbread consistency while still great and awesome if I wanted to make like a BLT and on a flatbread. It was not what I was looking for in our taco. So using this process of letting the dough rest and stay covered for the 30 minutes as well as the extra tricks that I'm about to show you here going forward really made a big difference for us. Before I started on the tortillas, I went out and grabbed a couple pounds of frozen venison from our freezer so I could get the meat going in the Instapot. I really feel like the Instapot is my second set of hands. If you don't have one and use it often, uh, I feel like you're making things a little harder than they have to be, but that's just personal preference. I know some people are pretty minimalist as far as their kitchen goes and don't like the extra appliances. To be quite honest, I purge through my stuff frequently, so I kind of understand, but this one always makes the cut. After 18 minutes of high pressure, I just open this up and then go ahead and chop the meat into the desired consistency that I'm looking for. And I do leave a little bit of water in the bottom. I actually add about a cup before I start to cook it. With the juice that came out of the meat, in addition to the water that was in there, after it's chopped up like this, I turn the sear function on and set it to about five minutes so it can finish browning. And I just put the lid on so it is actually keeping that steam inside and we can finish that cook process. Now, while I was doing this, my son came in bringing an upset baby girl. She had fallen and scraped her knees, so we had to stop for a little doctor mom time in the middle of the tortilla prep. She was so sad. She had just gotten out these new pants and scraped the knee just a little bit on them, but more than that, her knee hurt, and she just knew that the only thing that was going to fix it was, of course, a Band-Aid. She actually had goals of a Band-Aid for both knees, but after we gave the other one a good look, it really didn't have anything noticeable, so we went ahead and just went with the one. Now, with that being said, she no longer wanted to go out and party with the rest of the crew, so she stuck with me and helped out with the tortilla process because anytime she can go ahead and start pushing down on that press or just getting her hands on the dough, that is all it takes to make her happy. So it was a good mix to pull in after she had gotten a little bit hurt outside. After a quick stir of the meat to make sure that everything was turning out well and the addition of the seasoning, it was time to go ahead and get all of these pressed out. Now, I was a little bit worried about the shells themselves drying out. So what I decided to do was just work five at a time instead of doing all 10. We went ahead and pressed the first five in the press, but like I mentioned before, they weren't quite thin enough. So I had seen somebody say that the best thing to do was still to start with the press to get your circle formed, but then to go ahead and roll them out with a rolling pin. So that was how we decided to proceed here. Now using the press, we actually really like to use parchment paper because it helps us to keep it from sticking to the press number one, but more than that, it makes the actual circles of dough easier to move around after the pressing process has been completed. So once we went ahead and got all of these done, I went ahead and floured the countertop and was able to go ahead and roll these out to my desired thickness. Now 
Now the real question for my kitchen is not if the kids are gonna get involved, but how much I can get done or to what level I can accomplish the task before I have some tiny hands ready to, and willing to take over. And in this process, I was able to get quite a few done, but it didn't take long for my little assistant to make sure that she was getting in the mix. The biggest thing with her and that big marble rolling pin is just to make sure she doesn't pull it off on her toes, and we always manage that quite successfully, but still, of course, remains a caution for me. Now, during the rolling out process, I went ahead and warmed up my griddle over on the stove. I have heard that the secret is to get it kind of a medium warm, you don't want it too hot or they'll dry out and crack, but you also don't want it too low or they won't cook fast enough. So this is kind of a little delicate process. Once you cook the first one, you can kind of adjust your temperature and see if you need it to be a little bit warmer or if you can go a little bit cooler. Now remember, I'm throwing this all together before I head over to play ball. So I'm putting these in a stone baker that I actually have from Pampered Chef and I will drop a link in the comments down below. You will see me use their stones quite often in my cooking and they have really been a huge asset for us. I put it in the stone baker because that helped to keep the moisture in while I was actually gone. I have cooked full like chickens in there and stuff before. They turn out really great as well for the same reason. They have kind of helped to self baste. But what you're seeing here is the shell just slowly starting to cook and really bubble up on that cast iron. And then once you get to the desired level, we just went ahead and flipped them over, getting that backside browned before tossing it into the pan to stay warm for us during the entirety of the time that we were gone. Once we got back to my surprise, the moms did beat the boys, by the way, I should add that, add that in, um, but the shells themselves were super tender. Um, they did really have that consistency that I was looking for. My husband said they were absolutely amazing. The one thing I will say is they look a little bit rustic, and if you know what I'm saying by that, I just mean that they weren't quite as perfectly round but they still were super delicious and the desired consistency for sure. And if you're looking to make them with a regular white flour, they would turn out, of course, a lot more bright and more in line with the traditional uh, wheat taco shell. So whatever works for you on that would be great. I highly recommend them. And again, I'll toss a link down below. Now, what you're seeing here is after we had our Azure Standard Pickup, which is the reason that this is our final week of the challenge. Um, I did skip my Azure pickup last month, but going into month two, we just needed a few things. We're almost out of honey. Uh, the potatoes themselves are the, the last ones I bought were a year ago. Uh, so this is my once a year potato purchase. I buy 50 pounds at a time. If you want to know more on why I bul buy bulk potatoes like that and how I make them last all year, I will have an Azure video coming up soon uh, on how I get the best prices on organic bulk pantry and produce items. So make sure to subscribe if that's something that is interesting to you. But back to this meal, I threw those potatoes in the Instapot on 20 minutes at high pressure. I did um, chop them up just because they were so huge, but typically I don't. Um, after that time is up, you wanna just go ahead with a natural steam release for at least 10 minutes, and you will have the creamiest, most delicious baked potatoes that you have ever had. Um, just ready to go and easy to warm up again in days following if you have some leftovers. Now, on to the chicken at hand here. I am doing a semi-boneless spatchcock. Now, we did one of these earlier in the pantry challenge, but this time I remembered to thaw out my pesto that I made last year from the garden, and that is actually what takes it completely over the top and makes this one of my kids' all-time favorite meals. So they ended up super happy with this one. But the spatchcock basically means what I'm doing is cutting out the backbone of the chicken itself. And instead of just pressing it flat, I went ahead and took my knife and slid down both sides of the rib cage and removed the entire rib cage. Now with the rib cage itself, I put it in a Ziploc and threw it in the fridge. 
Um, I'm going to make some chicken bone broth with it and one that I had done previously. So it, there's nothing going to waste here. The whole thing will be easily used, but you're able to keep the skin on and lay this chicken beautifully flat in your pan. Uh, what I'm doing here is drying off the skin. Again, that is the secret to crispy. If you're looking for crispy, delicious skin on anything, you want to get it completely dry. And I'm wearing gloves here just as a side note, not just to keep my hands clean, but because I cut it on that stinking box grater a few days ago and I didn't want anything into that cut on my finger. Because of that, I called in my assistant here to go ahead and spread out the oil for me and then I rubbed it in with my gloves. He also came in clutch and added the salt and pepper here for us. The pesto itself I did hold. I didn't want to burn it on the pan or in the pan over on the skillet, so I'm going to put that on before we slide it into the oven. Since our goal here with the chicken is just a good crispy skin, we're not actually cooking it on the stove top, I went ahead and just did skin side down. I did season the top of it that you're seeing here, which is technically the bottom, uh, but then once I got to the crispness that I was looking for on the skin itself, I went ahead and took two sets of tongs and flipped it over. Now this can be a little tricky to move. I have ripped it apart before. So make sure that you have a second set or a great big spatula, which occurred to me like at that moment that I had something better, which I'll show you here shortly. Now you saw me put that into the oven and here I am realizing that I completely forgot to get the pesto on it. So I pulled that thing straight back out and got that homemade pesto. Now this pesto was made last summer and I went ahead and froze it. Pesto doesn't can well, but it freezes amazingly well. Once it was totally covered in the pesto, I did slide it back in. I, I baked that for 400 degrees until the internal temperature reached at least 165. Now, this is the all-time hit at my house. If you have never roasted off cabbage in big slices like this, I highly recommend it. Not only is it one of these most simple side dishes that you will ever do, but the roasted flavor of this cabbage is absolutely amazing. I did one head and I could have done a second tray slash should have done a second tray. My husband actually said he could have skipped the chicken entirely to just eat the roasted cabbage because it was that good. Uh, one of the other things I love about cabbage itself is just how absolutely gorgeous it is. If you ever cook with produce and just look at the amazing creation that God has made for us, um, I find it hard not to admire that beauty. So maybe I'm weird or maybe you're like me. Let me know down below. But what I do with this after I get it chopped up is I just added it to that big baking stone that I use. Again, uh, link in the comments down below if you're looking for stones like this because they just make everything brown up and crisp so beautifully. Um, but I'm putting this all on here. It is a little bit of a Jenga project to get all of them on. But once done, all I did was top this with oil, salt, and pepper. That's it. Then you go ahead and put it in the oven. I already have that chicken going at the 400 temperature. If I was just doing the cabbage alone, I would have thrown this up to 425 or 450 to get it done a little bit faster, but that's really not necessary. And I was able to get it perfectly done right below the chicken. So this was really one of those meals that once everything is in the oven, you're pretty much good to go and you can complete your cleaning process during that time while it's baking, which saves a lot of time at the end. Now, when my son saw me pull it out at this point, he came over and told me that it was not done. And I'm totally aware of that. I just like to flip it over halfway through the actual baking process to make sure that I'm getting that softness and the warmth from the pan really delivered through both sides. That is definitely an option. You could leave it whole and not mess with flipping, but I really found that I like the texture and the crispness to be on both sides. And so this just helps me out. One thing about my house, if you're here long, you'll notice lots of costumes. So Wonder Woman decided to join me for a quick hug and kiss before she ran off to play with Elsa. 
both of which will be joining us at the dinner table here shortly. Uh, but I had to make sure we got that accomplished before I was able to get the cabbage back in. Uh, those things just don't get old, right? So I always have time to hug and kiss and play with them just for a moment as long as they're safely away from the oven and nothing is hot or burning at the time. So now the chicken is out and I did go ahead and temp it. Like I said, I'm very cautious about temperature. If you don't have a digital instant read thermometer, make sure to get one. That's the only way to know that your food is safe and also a great way to know when your breads are done. So make sure you have something like that on hand. We had reached the desired temperature. So I remember during that process earlier, this huge fish spatula that I had earlier, and it was the absolute perfect thing to remove that whole chicken from the pan without messing it up. So if you're gonna be doing something like this, having the versatility of some larger spatulas does really come in handy. Now here I'm making a butter sauce with the pan drippings. And I have to tell you, it turned out delicious. Now we could have added this to the potatoes, but we decided to go ahead and top it on the cabbage, which you'll see here shortly. It was an amazing butter cream sauce from the drippings of the chicken. And I also added a little garlic in. Never let something like that go to waste. Those, what's in the pan is just liquid gold as far as flavor goes. So make sure to go ahead and capitalize that and make yourself a quick sauce if you have anything of the sort to go with it. Now, as you heard me mention in the intro, this is it for us. Our pantry challenge is wrapping up. We won't be pulling out the camera for every single meal moving forward. But what we will be doing is a what's for dinner series. So if you are interested in staying up with what's going on in our kitchen, make sure to subscribe because I plan to pull out some of our old family favorites from a family recipe book that my mom put together of our family favorites when I was a kid in addition to some recipes that were given to us at my wedding shower, where everybody in attendance brought their favorite special recipes. In addition to the family favorites in my What's for Dinner series, I plan to throw in some budget recipes, as well as just some homestead farm-to-table meals as well. So if you want to continue to follow along with our kitchen antics, we would love to have you. the chicken set and rest for at least 10 minutes then I go ahead and cut it up and this is one of those things that's extra easy when you do go to the added step to remove the actual rib cage during the process of getting the chicken prepped to go in the pan one when I've left the bones before it does make it a little bit more difficult because then I'm trying to have the kids watch out for the bones that come along with the rib cage so this is just one extra added peace of mind the only bones that I have left are legs and the wings, which my kids are really familiar with and don't have any problems with. So after the chicken was complete and the cabbage was on the plate, we went ahead and added those potatoes, coated it in butter, and called in everyone to enjoy our delicious meal. So from our house to yours, I just want to extend our greatest gratitude for those of you who have joined us. And we really appreciate each and every one of you. Again, links to everything that we've made are down below. And we hope to see you back again very soon. So until next time, bye friends.